Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Nelson Jattel, Water Steward Director for the Okanagan Basin Water Board. I'm hoping that everybody can hear me clearly and you can now see the uh, intro slide for this year's 2018 Okanagan Water Supply, Water Management Support Update. Um, we've got a, a great group and I see there's a number of people that are, are uh, starting to, to add on. We've got over 100 people uh, that have registered for this morning's webinar and uh, looking forward to uh, providing a number of different perspectives on the current uh, water supply of the Okanagan. Um, I'm going to be sort of controlling a master reel here and so all of the presenters will, will just be letting me know when I need to change slides as, as sort of a format and uh, we'll get this uh, this show started. If there's anybody that has any questions or for some reason you can't hear us or there's technical issues, uh, please go to the chat box uh, in the bottom right hand corner and uh, just fire me off a quick note and we'll try to uh, try to correct any any issues that we might have technically. Okay. Um, my name is Nelson Jutel. I'll be your host uh, for this morning's one hour session. Uh, this is the seventh year that the Okanagan Basin Water Board has been providing for these updates. Uh, this is one of two uh, webinars that we'll be doing this year. Uh, so this one is in week 16 of, uh, of sort of the cycle. And then we'll be doing our second one uh, on May 8th, uh, providing for a further update in terms of where things are at for Okanagan water supply. So to put things into perspective, um, this is what we would anticipate for a, a usual um, hydrologic peak for the Okanagan. Um, you have sort of total water in the Okanagan largely coming off as, as snow melt. Uh, here we are in week 16 uh, for an average year. And this is just intended really to provide for some context uh, in terms of where we're at in the overall uh, water cycle. and um, get sort of an update in terms of what we might expect as we get closer to this peak, which we usually would expect uh, sometimes in uh, in early June. Um, so we're going to be covering a number of different components to uh, current state of basin hydrology. Uh, we'll be talking this morning about the snowpack and storage. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about Okanagan uh, lake levels and, and also the, the river as it goes south from Penticton. Uh, we'll have a very interesting snapshot of groundwater and what's taking place uh, in different groundwater aquifers throughout the Okanagan. And um, we'll be talking a little bit about some some forecasting um, and uh, where the weather's going. We'll also be talking a little bit about uh, the fire status and uh, some of the updates from the 2017 flood forest fire report uh, that is now complete and we'll be winding that up. So in terms of um, who's talking today, um, I'll be providing a little bit of context and we'll have Kelly Garcia uh, from the Okanagan Basin Water Board um, providing some information on some communication strategies um, that have been worked on for the last couple of years that relate to both drought and flood. Uh, we'll be then hearing from Dave Campbell from the BC River Forecast Center. Um, we'll be talking about this year's snowpack and, and water supply in the Okanagan. Uh, we'll then hear from Sean Reimer, uh, who will be giving us an update on the Okanagan River and, and uh, what's going on throughout the system. Uh, we have Gwen Graham from Environment and Climate Change Canada and the International Joint Commission. We'll be talking about uh, uh, Soyuz Lake and the Soyuz Lake levels. We'll then be hearing from Nicole Pyatt on Okanagan groundwater supply. And uh, we'll be wrapping things up uh, with a report from Ray Crampton and where things are going for fire season readiness uh, and also a little bit on the report that was developed or is developing for the 2017 forest fire and flood uh, review. So as some background, um, the intention of this webinar is really to provide for better information uh, for a number of individuals that are either managing water uh, or rely on it uh, for, for their summer operations. Um, we believe that better decisions on Okanagan water uh, are supported by better information being provided. 
Um, we've been doing these, these webinars for a while, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the intent is to share resources, identify problems, suggest solutions, and really improve communication as we move uh, through uh, this part of the hydrology of the Okanagan. Uh, the Okanagan Basin Water Board has a water governance mandate, and uh, it's really intended to be able to support communication and collaboration throughout the region. Uh, this is one of the water management support tools that we offer every year. And um, collaboration and community to community uh, information sharing is, is largely what, uh, what this webinar is about. One of the interesting things as we, we look at the water supply in the Okanagan and, and we look at uh, the flow of water that starts at Wood and Kalmalka Lake and then goes into the north arm of Okanagan and then travels south uh, eventually through Okanagan River and into Asoyas Lake and then into the Columbia River uh, and then flowing into uh, the Pacific Ocean from there, that there's a number of different trade-offs when we look at managing water, everything from mitigating flood risks uh, to supporting uh, fish life cycles and, and, uh, and fish management, as well as dealing with irrigation demand needs uh, and tourism throughout the session. So this really, um, water management does link to a number of different key economic and social indicators throughout the region. And uh, today's report uh, provides us uh, with a little bit of an insight in terms of what we might expect in this year as we look outside our windows and uh, see the rain and uh, a number of uh, sort of indicators for a very wet spring. Um, as, as always, the OBWB provides for a regional approach uh, and supports practical water management issues. Uh, there's a number of different pieces, and, and this morning is really intended to bring those pieces together to be able to provide for a comprehensive picture of water supply in the Okanagan. Uh, there's a number of variations between drainages. Uh, we've seen in, in some years where we've had uh, some sub-basins in the Okanagan flooding, while others were experiencing forest fires. Uh, each water source needs its own water management strategy, and uh, a number of them have those already in place. And because we're connected, uh, we need to ensure that these strategies uh, are coordinated. Um, this slide really illustrates the annual uh, amount of uh, inflow into Okanagan Lake. So each one of these red bars represents total um, annual input into the system, into the Okanagan Basin. And, you know, as obvious, there this is a very variable system. Uh, you can see some significant peaks. Um, we often talk about the drought situation in the sort of 1929 uh, to 32 uh, window. Uh, and we also talk about some of the major flooding events. And I think one of the interesting things that this graph, which only goes to 2014, indicates is that there seems to be um, some changing in precip in the Okanagan in general, um, but more notably is that the variability is increasing. Um, we're getting more extreme highs, and uh, we're also seeing more frequent um, drought conditions throughout the system. And, and this is just, I think, in part, um, a residual of having a, a small uh, basin that's hydrologically dominated by snowmelt, and uh, we're starting to see some of those uh, impacts and, and variability as a result of climate change. Um, so back to this graph, uh, one of the interesting things is that as we go through the system and we get into sort of weeks 40 to 44, um, it, it turns into periods in the spring or the fall where we're looking to manage both for increased demand from agriculture and also demand for fish. And so as we look to manage some of our water supplies, it's not just about this peak that we're looking to manage for floods, but also how is it that we deal with water supplies later on in the year. This is large, the larger picture that, uh, that we always speak to. All right, at this time, I will hand the mic over to Kelly uh, to take us through some of the communication work that's been going on throughout the Valley. Kelly. Thank you, Nelson. Can everybody hear me? Nelson, you can hear me? Yes, I can. Thank okay, you. thank you. Okay, so... Um, as you probably recall, in 2015, all of southern BC was in a provincially declared level three or four drought by August. Uh, but at the same time, most Okanagan reservoirs were doing okay, and water purveyors in the Okanagan were in normal stage one or at the most stage two watering restrictions. So we saw a disconnect between the provincial declaration for the Okanagan and the local situation, which caused some confusion and, and uncertainty. 
So because of our valley-wide mandate, the OBWB was uniquely positioned to step in and lead communication and coordinate activities during the 2015 drought. So our executive director spent a lot of time on the phone talking to provincial water managers, federal fisheries folks, local water suppliers, and First Nations, and ended up sending out 11 emails to a very wide distribution list over the summer as that situation progressed. So following that, in early 2016, we put together this strategy, the Okanagan Drought Response Strategy, to more formally outline the process OBWB will follow and the actions we will take to respond to drought in the valley. So actions taken under this strategy are meant to complement and support actions that are taken under the province's provincial and their Thompson Okanagan region response plans. And of course, the response plans of water suppliers locally. So most of the actions within this strategy focus on communication and coordination because that's what's within the OBWB's mandate. And it provides a structure and a system for information flow between the province and water purveyors and water purveyor to water purveyor. Next slide. So last year, the OBWB was included on internal provincial drought calls that were held for the Thompson Okanagan region, which we greatly appreciated. So as we moved from flooding last spring to super dry conditions, uh, that improved communication we had with the province, it enabled us to prepare information bulletins and release them to coincide with provincial drought declarations. Next slide. So those are just a couple of examples of the um, bulletins that we put out last year. So then the other initiative I've been working on uh, related to drought is helping Okanagan communities move towards more consistent and coordinated planning across the valley. So we've put together templates for drought management plans, which are based on the provincial dealing with drought handbook and input from local water suppliers. And we've held workshops to bring purveyors together to share knowledge and experiences. We've also provided funding through our grants program to support the preparation of drought management plans. So the pur purpose of this, of course, is to get everybody working together, have a more coordinated and consistent approach and get some really resilient and robust um, planning and response across the entire valley. Next slide. So we're taking a similar approach to support flood management planning across the valley. You may have seen an announcement in the news last week regarding significant funding and a unique partnership that is helping communities plan and prepare for future flood events. So the OBWB received $1.45 million to work with the Okanagan Nation Alliance and its members, commu member communities, local governments, including all three regional districts, Armstrong, Vernon, and Kelowna, and the BC government to complete flood mapping for the entire watershed. So the flood mapping will use LIDAR, which is a radar technology that is a form of aerial imaging. And LIDAR is combined with geo-referenced aerial photos to create an accurate digital 3D map of the landscape. LIDAR will show where water is likely to flow, and it, it will also include modeling of how much water can be expected and help determine vulnerable locations. So this information that will be collected through LIDAR and then put into flood maps can feed into regional flood management plans and help support communication efforts during floods. So that's it for me, Nelson. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, next up is Dave Campbell with the River Forecast Center. Dave. Thanks, Nelson. So I'll, I'll sort of switch gears a little bit and um, do a bit of uh, look at where we've come this season and uh, a bit of crystal balling in terms of where we might expect to go. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, this year we've, uh, you know, to put it into the context of uh, the climate regime we're in, um, we're in a La Nina cycle this year. And uh, El Nino, La Nina for BC tends to be one of those um, stronger drivers uh, that we have in terms of seasonal weather. Uh, La Nina cycles tend to uh, lead into years where we have uh, cooler uh, to some extent uh, or wetter weather, particularly uh, in areas in the southern part of the province. Uh, and we tend to see higher snowpacks. And, you know, from year to year, we can get variation in this, but uh, certainly this year, that pattern has played out with uh, fairly high uh, snowpacks throughout the Okanagan. We can look here at uh, just the distribution of from our April 1st surveys 
that were taken uh, by regional partners in the Ministry of Environment. Um, and we can really see that, you know, for the most part, it's fairly ubiquitous, uh, extremely high snowpack in the range of 140 to 180 percent of normal through most sites. Uh, and, and again, spread throughout the, um, the watershed. Um, we look back to other uh, La Nina years. Uh, those that come into mind are last year uh, was a La Nina year, uh, 2012, 2011, uh, 2007. Oh, sorry, 1999, 2007 was wasn't. Um, and so oftentimes we see both uh, that, that snowpack side of things, but we also, also see that the, the impact kind of linger into the spring. And so it's not uncommon to have um, wet periods as we get into that April, May, or even June period. And we've had that in, in uh, recent uh, examples of La Nina. So a bit of context to that, certainly from the snow side of things, looking fairly high uh, across the board, as well as a, a variation that we've seen over the last few years has been uh, oftentimes a bit of a split between low elevation and high elevation sites. It seems this year really we've we've had um, fairly decent snow uh, and snow accumulation or precipitation that uh, has been throughout the valley. So we're we're not necessarily seeing the strong gradient where um, snow is just up high and, and not as much uh, lower elevations as we went through the winter. Next slide. Uh, just looking at a few examples to compare with historical uh, conditions. Uh, from the automated sites, and we can see green uh, line out from last year. Obviously, Silver Star has got a bit of issues, but um, you know, an interesting thing from last year was really um, fairly normal-looking snowpack up until about this time, uh, and then it was uh, a much more rapid uh, late-season accumulation as we went through April into May. And so, with uh, fairly wet weather there, that really drove things. This year, we're really seeing that signal much earlier, uh, and we really continued to see that ongoing uh, higher than normal snowpack. As we see uh, things right now as well, we haven't really turned the corner. We'd expect to start to see melt happening at the upper elevation sites uh, around about now uh, or, or even a little bit earlier. When we look at places like Brenda Mines, um, it tends to be in early April we start to see that melt. That's more indicative of kind of mid-elevation terrain. Um, and we haven't really seen that uh, transition happen yet. So we've got lots of snow there and it, it really has yet to come down. We are starting to see kind of more in the lower elevation side of things that um, that as that snow is melted off lower down, um, we're getting a fair bit of ground saturation and, and other um, sort of runoff at, at the more local small scale, uh, lower elevation. Next slide. So just kind of wrapping it up into a basin level, uh, Okanagan, if we look at all the basin uh, measurements, uh, or our index value is 152% of normal, um, and then the smilk mean similar. Um, into the context of the province, obviously this has really been the bullseye of where we've seen these the highest snowpacks elsewhere in the province. It's high, but not quite as uh, to the same extent as the Okanagan. Next slide. From a water perspective, obviously the high snowpack means uh, a lot of uh, water stored for uh, storage and, and, and bringing down as we go into the, the melt cycle. But uh, the flip side obviously is uh, concerns over, over the flood risk associated with the snow. Typically when we get over about 120% of normal, uh, we start to anticipate increased risk from flooding. Uh, and over about 135 is, is quite a bit uh, elevated risk. As you can see, 152%, we're, we're well into that high uh, or extreme uh, flood risk side of things um, in terms of uh, the last uh, 30, 40 years of record, we're, we're tied for the highest uh, basin index year. Uh, the last one was 1999, so we're uh, certainly extremely high in terms of that, that snow side of things. And, and so certainly the expectation is, particularly in the, the smaller basins that drain into the watershed uh, or into the, the lake, that those uh, do have increased potential for flooding this year. Next slide. Uh, we look at more of the volume side of things, and I, I think Sean will talk to more up to this, is just looking at the seasonal forecasts, and they're in line uh, in terms of the volume of runoff in line with what we're seeing in the snowpack, about 150 to 160% of uh, normal anticipated volume inflow into the lake. Next slide. Uh, just a little uh, overview of uh, information people can get uh, as we go through the year. Uh, the River Forecast Center has updated our website, uh, so more simpli simplified URL, gov.bc.ca slash riverforecast. Uh, the content's organized a little bit differently there, so hopefully people can find what they're they're looking for, but um, the main difference is really snow information if people are looking 
for that is under a separate theme uh, within the Ministry of Environment's page, and that's reflecting that that's organized not by the River Forecast Center, but by uh, yeah, MOE. Uh, next slide. Uh, people can get up-to-date information on water levels themselves. We produce uh, information on that, as well as 10-day uh, river forecast uh, modeling from our Clever model. And we're trying to expand as much as we can um, some of the locations that we have uh, within the Okanagan to try to expand it to more of the, the real-time. Uh, there. Um, next slide. So just summarizing, certainly uh, extremely high snowpacks uh, throughout the region. Uh, and anticipating an increased flood risk be from that, as well as the higher overall runoff. Obviously, weather is going to play a key pa a factor uh, as well as we go through the season. We saw last year that uh, extreme rainfall really uh, kind of doubled down on uh, some of the snowpack risks that were there. And so that obviously would be the main concern uh, in is seeing that kind of wet wetter pattern uh, continue uh, over the next month or so. Um, I think there are some concerns over just level of ground saturation that we've got right now. We're already seeing landslides and things like that. We tend to have a kind of positive feedback when we have uh, ground saturation that may have played a role last year as well, where um, we, we end up getting much more uh, rapid runoff uh, because of that. Uh, it appears as we're already kind of seeing that delay in the melt season. So hopefully we'll start to see that turning the corner soon, but uh, to be to be seen. So I'll, I'll wrap up there and uh, back to you, Nelson. Great, Dave. Thanks a lot. That was excellent. Um, our next presenter is Sean Reimer from Flinro RD, uh, and you'll be talking about the Okanagan lake levels. Sean. Sure. So just to uh, talk about uh, Okanagan Lake to begin with, um, this is up till yesterday. The green line uh, that you see is our current lake level, uh, and, and certainly we're uh, much lower than uh, particularly last year when we were expecting drought conditions, uh, so that we are approximately 50 centimeters lower than we are for the same date last year as of today. And uh, it's the lowest that we've been purposefully since 1999 uh, in an anticipation of a high runoff year. Uh, certainly we've been lower a few times um, following drought years when we didn't want to be that low. Uh, but uh, again, we've been very aggressive with some of our flows to try to, to get to where we are. Uh, again, currently we're about 104 centimeters from our full pool annual target that we try to achieve uh, near the end of June. So we uh, have been making some room for this anticipated runoff. Uh, I say we are currently lower than a similar time in 1997. Uh, in 1997, we had the highest inflow uh, the, on record. It was approximately 40% more or 45% more than we had last year, in, in fact. Uh, and that year, we did go over full pool um, by about 36 centimeters. But again, we can't uh, anticipate that we're going to have uh, that kind of inflow into the lake this year. So in terms of Okanagan Lake, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to manage the flows um, fairly well uh, in there and uh, of course it's going to be very dependent on uh, the snow melt, uh, the peak and, and how quickly it comes in to the lake as well as uh, precipitation over the next few months. Next slide. Uh, these are our outflows uh, at Penticton uh, Okanagan Lake Dam, um, certainly showing that we've been very aggressive this year um, because of this extreme snowpack. Um, we're above our maximum, in fact, right now for this time of year, and we are at our sort of design channel capacity uh, in between Okanagan Lake and uh, Skaha Lake, so we're at about 60 cubic meters per second. We certainly have been higher uh, under emergency situations like last year where we got up to about 78 or 79 cubic meters per second. But uh, those flows create all sorts of havoc in the Oliver area, uh, as well as cause uh, some erosion in the river. So uh, we're much more prone to try to uh, keep it at our design flows. And, and again, these are our maximum design flows. Next slide. Uh, Dave showed some of this before, um, but maybe providing a little bit of context and, and so people can get a, a, an understanding of exactly what that means. So for every 3.46 uh, 
um, kilodecameter cubed, which is, uh, translates to one million cubic meters. Uh, it's worth about a centimeter uh, of, lake, of water on Okanagan Lake. So again, we're approximately one meter, or I think we're 104 centimeters to full pool. And what this means is the um, forecast coming in to between now and the end of June suggests that we have to deal with about two meters of water on Okanagan Lake. So the fact that we have room to fill it up a little over a meter means that we have to discharge about a meter uh, of water in that time. Uh, certainly that is, is uh, manageable at this point. But again, it's going to be very conditional on the uh, accuracy of the forecast, and, and, and again, that's just a, uh, it's going to depend on a lot of the uh, precipitation uh, that we see going forward. Um, on, on Kalamalka Lake, uh, again, we're about a half a half a meter to the top of our operating range, so that's sort of the room we have to fill, and uh, again, we have to deal with about 69 centimeters. We're going to have to average about four cubic meters per second um, at the Cal Lake Dam um, for May and June in order to achieve that. And that's very difficult because uh, it, basically we have the gates wide open on Cal Lake Dam and have done so since the beginning of uh, January. And unfortunately, Cal Lake has to rise in order for us to uh, be able to push that water out. So um, Cal Lake certainly has shown signs that it's uh, beginning to rise right now with some of the precipitation we've seen, as well as uh, probably initiating some of that snow melt at the lower elevations. And uh, just to put it in perspective, we're trying to get Okanagan Lake down a little bit more if we potentially can. We would love to see that on Cal Lake. Um, but traditionally, this is the week that we sort of bottom out on our ability to uh, drop the lake any lower. So that's just something to be expected. Uh, we're trying, but uh, it's going to be hard pressed uh, when the, um, that mid elevation snow starts to go. Uh, so uh, next slide. And this is just showing us what uh, we have for our inflows up to this um, so far this year. Um, it, it says that we're in December and in, in the year before, it, it shows uh, 2018, but that should be 2017. Um, but really, our inflows up to this point um, aren't, haven't been anything too above uh, normal or anything like this, which be, basically is a statement to the fact that uh, we really haven't seen the water uh, start to, or the snow start to melt yet or start to really go. Next slide, or that may be it for me. Yes, that's it for me. Great, thanks so much, Sean. Our next presenter is Gwen Graham from uh, Climate or uh, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and with the International Joint Commission, and he'll be talking about Asoyas Lake and some of the orders there. Gwen. Hi, Nelson. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation to present. So I'm I'm going to briefly explain the the role of the IJC or International Joint Commission in in managing lake levels on transboundary Osoyoos Lake, and also just review current conditions uh, following on the the previous presentations. And I think we've got a good order here, so everything that was presented earlier um, on the the climate, uh, uh, water supply, and, and Okanagan Lake operations is going to is going to mesh well here. Um, just to, just for background, the International Joint Commission operates um, under under a mandate uh, through the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty between Canada and the U.S. And of relevance to Soyuz Lake, uh, Article 4 of that treaty basically says that any any dam or, or uh, works on a river that can create a backwater effect across up and across the border, um, affecting water levels across the border, uh, requires an order of approval from the International Joint Commission. Um, so for for a Soyuz Lake, uh, Zozel Dam, which is located just south of the the uh, outlet of a Soyuz Lake on the Okanogan River in Washington State, uh, does have that that um, ability to affect water levels across the border up into Canada, and so the International Joint Commission uh, issued orders, um, essentially water management orders, uh, that that govern the operations of 
of uh, Zosal Dam to a certain extent. The dam, uh, depending on the season and flow conditions, does does affect the water levels on a Soyuz Lake. But at this time of year, when uh, water level, uh, when when inflow to the lake and, and fresh out is just sort of starting up, um, the, the dam is essentially operating in a, a free flow or uh, fully gates fully open mode. Um, so it is the, the dam itself is not exerting an influence on the lake. It's natural conditions at this point. The the IJC has issued orders um, since the uh, the mid mid 1940s. Um, the original dam, uh, Zozal Dam, was uh, was created by the Zozal Lumber Company, which was a, to create a, a mill mill pond for their operations. And that that structure was uh, was rebuilt in 1987. Um, to show which is the, the current structure that's shown in that picture right now. Uh, under the IJC order, uh, a, a board of control was, was created. And if we go to the next slide, and the board of control basically oversees the um, implementation and uh, conformance with the, the terms of the IJC order for a Soyuz Lake. Uh, so in the Canadian section, we have uh, Bruno Tassoni as the Canadian co-chair. And on the U.S. section, Cindy Barton with the USGS as the U.S. co-chair. And some of you may recognize a number of people here. Uh, we have Sue McCordiff as, uh, as one of our, our Canadian board members, Brian Simons, Anna Warwick Sears, Ted White, who's recently replaced Glenn Davidson uh, with uh, BC uh, Ministry of uh, Forests, Lands, Natural Resource Operations, and Rural Development. So I need to update the title on that slide. And then myself as the Canadian board secretary, uh, and I, I have a U.S. counterpart board secretary with the USGS, Andy Gendazic. And so in terms of communication, if you have questions about the board, uh, best to uh, communicate or e email or call uh, the, the Canadian or U.S. board secretaries, and we can, we can follow up. Just to the next slide, just uh, to position the Soyuz Lake uh, Zozal Dam in the, in the basin context. Um, you can see the schematic. It shows Okanagan Lake as the, the main storage uh, feature in the Okanagan Basin. Um, so it is a it is a driver for water level on on a Soyuz Lake in terms of uh, the, the dam on Okanagan Lake uh, dictating largely the the flows uh, through the Okanagan River and into Soyuz Lake. The Similkameen River is shown there as well. Uh, it is very significant too. If you follow the trace of it, it connects with the Okanogan River just just below Zozal Dam, and um, it is it is a, a much more significant system in terms of total discharge. So it can create a backwater effect, up, uh, which which basically sort of blocks flow uh, down. Out, out of a Soyuz Lake when the Similkameen River is running high. So Similkameen River high flows can actually affect water levels on a Soyuz Lake. It's sort of like a hydraulic dam effect, if you want to think of it that way. And under extremely high uh, Similkameen flow rates, uh, you can actually have reverse flow and not just a backwater effect, but reverse flow up, up the system. Um, so again, it's a, it's, it's, when we're looking at water levels on Soyuz Lake, we consider both what's happening in the Okanagan River system as well as the Similkameen. So we'll go to the next slide. And to, to show what uh, what is driving water levels on a Soyuz Lake right now, first I'm going to look at the o Okanagan River uh, discharge plot for, for the Oliver gauge. And you can see, as Sean mentioned, um, since about mid-March, Okanagan River flows have been steadily increasing, and this is primarily because of the Okanagan Lake operations that, that Sean mentioned. Um, we're, we're slightly out uh, above the, uh, the historic range for this time of year. Um, the blue line is the, the current uh, plot, and the, uh, the darker green line set against the lighter green period of record is last year. So we're early this year in terms of uh, high flows. And if we go if we go to the next plot, we'll see what's happening on the Okanogan River downstream of Zozal Dam. And again, it's it's largely oh, um, I think Nelson, we just need to back up one slide there. Okay, so this again is the Okanogan River. The name changes as we cross the border, um, just downstream of Zozal Dam. And you can see again the blue line for for this year's water levels and the the dark green line showing last year's. Um, 
again, things are early in terms of high flows for this year. Uh, it's mirroring largely the uh, the Okanagan River uh, discharge plot. Um, so Zozo Dam is uh, is is operating or has operated to create a bit of storage on Osoyoos Lake, and you can see that dip in in uh, early March. Um, but generally, there's fairly minimal storage space on Osoyoos Lake. It's a much smaller lake than than Okanagan Lake, obviously, and it's eas easily overwhelmed by by high inflows. Um, so right right now. Dozel Dam is operating in in a free fall mode essentially. The gates are fully fully out of the water, um, and uh, and so it's just again natural conditions dictating the, uh, uh, the 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 flow rates through the dam and and uh, into the Okanogan River downstream. So now we can go to the next plot, and this is what's happening on lake level in in uh, so East Lake. So the previous plots showed upstream and downstream conditions, and the lake level is largely the, the expression of that balancing. And I show last year's on the left and the current trend on the right. We're, this, this was updated as of last week. Um, the, the blue line is the lake level elevation, and the, the black lines in the grayed out area, those are the IJC, that's what we call the IJC rule curve. Uh, for a Soyuz Lake, so it, it assigns minimum elevations and the maximum elevations uh, that, that change sort of seasonally through the year. Right now, we're into the sort of spring rise period, um, and then and then it plateaus at a at what we call a summer period maximum, and then again drops down in the fall. So I looked at the the water levels today, and and that that um, upper black line, which is the, the upper end of the IJC rule curve, um, we're, we're pretty much hitting that right now, um, and uh, which is okay under, under natural high inflow conditions. The IJC order recognizes that there's a limit as to what the Zozel Dam operator can control. So as long as they're not doing anything to, to hold back water and to, to raise the level on a Soyuz Lake, they're in compliance, and, and basically we just have to let natural, natural uh, conditions uh, run their course. Um, as I mentioned again, uh, right now we're mostly seeing the rise due to releases from Okanagan Lake. As the Similkameen uh, River, as Freshet kicks in on the Similkameen River and discharge rates increase, uh, we could see um, again a backwater effect that will further uh, raise the levels on the Soyuz Lake. Um, and again, this is all happening a couple of weeks earlier than, than last year's uh, um, shed inflows. So we're, we're watching this carefully. Um, moving forward, uh, again, uh, watch as, as with most people, we're watching the weather conditions, um, looking at the temperature changes, just get a sense of when, when snowpack melt and is going to kick in and, and how intense or over what period it will, it will um, take place. Uh, hopefully we'll have a bit more of a drawn out melt, but um, we'll see. We're watching flow rates in the Similkameen as well as uh, in the Okanagan River, and um, one of the in that rule curve, you'll notice there's that uh, dashed orange line above and below the lake. That that provide that's that's what we call our our drought condition curve. So it, if a drought condition was declared, it would allow for a bit more storage on a Soyuz Lake and the ability to draw down a little bit more uh, if if needed. Um, Obviously, under, with current conditions, the board has assessed the April forecast in, information for both the Okanagan Lake and, and the Similkameen, and, and we are not in a position to issue a, a drought declaration. No big surprise there. But um, so basically, the the black line elements of the the rule curve there will apply this year, and um, and we'll we'll see you know how how high the lake goes um, and uh, and. Over what period it will it will come back within range of the IGC orders. Okay, so that that wraps up my summary of uh, water management on the transboundary Soyuz Lake under the IGC's um, order of, of approval for Zozel Dam and, and essentially the order for a Soyuz Lake. Thank you. And thank you very much for that. Uh, it was a great perspective. Uh, our next presenter is Nicole Payette with uh, Flinro RD and uh, she'll be providing for an update on groundwater throughout the Okanagan Basin. Uh, Nicole. Hi there, thanks Nelson. Um, as mentioned, we're going to look at some of the provincial groundwater observation wells 
Uh, we'll start in the north and move down to the south. If you can move to the next slide, please, Elson. So we'll start with this one with a bit of a more thorough explanation. So on the x-axis of our graph, we have an annual cycle. Um, we have a, a number of pieces of information on this graph. So we have historical maximum, mean, and minimum levels. Um, so the maximum being the yellow line at the top, the minimum being the red at the bottom, and the light blue line in the middle being the mean. In addition to that, we have information from last year, which is the green line, and we have information that has been validated from this year already. If you look close to the January side of the axis, you can see the purple, and then kind of that bit of a darker blue color is where we are now. So for example, in the context of this well, which is in Enderby, and it's quite deep, we have water levels that are just slightly higher than average. So we'll be able to follow on the map as we move from the north to the south, a couple of other things to note on these graphs is that they do have different um, y-axes as we move across, as there are um, different water levels that are observed within these sets of wells. And we also have different periods of record. So you can see this well has been in use since 1971, uh, and some of our other records will be a bit newer. Next slide, please. So in another quite deep well, again, we've got the average conditions in green, and you can see that we're slightly below average in this deeper aquifer. Next slide. Up in Salmachine in the Holkar area, we are above average um, and actually above historical record. Um, so that blue squiggly line that's about 12 meters below ground surface. Um, are the observable levels right now, and this is uh, a more shallow aquifer than the ones that we're seeing in the previous slides. So this period of record, though, is quite short. It's only been in um, use since 2012, um, just in terms of context for length of record there. Next slide, please. Uh, moving over to Lumbee, um, you can note that we have this average condition um, or sorry, the observed conditions in the green line moving across, and we've already moved past average conditions, and we're moving um, in an upward manner past where we observed uh, water levels in the Lumbee area last year. So we're on a bit of a, a steep uptick in that area right now. Next slide, please. Observed in Winfield as well, so this is a, a shallow aquifer that is uh, between Ellison Lake um, in that Winfield area proper on Jim Bailey Road. You can see that the water levels from last year were the historical maximum levels that were observed in the, the period of record, um, and they didn't really come down. Um, there are some infrastructure changes on that site, but you can see also that um, at this particular location, we're quite close to the surface. So we're at about five meters below ground surface in this location right now. Next slide, please. Allison is in Kelowna out by the airport. You can see here as well that we're observing uh, higher than ever recorded water levels in this well also. This is, I think, our shortest period of record. This well was put in in 2014. Um, and you can see from this that uh, we're still about 20 meters below ground surface, so still a lot of space um, in the aquifers in that area. Next slide, please. This is Rutland um, in Kelowna, and our water levels last year and this year are lining up quite similarly. We're between minimum recorded levels and average conditions, a bit closer to average conditions. Next slide, please. McCullough is in southeast Kelowna up on the hill there, and quite similar to last year, a little bit more water than last year, and above minimum ever recorded conditions. So these aquifers are a bit deeper than some of the previous ones that we saw, and you can see um, Twin Lakes, which is shallow, we are again above ever recorded water levels, so this is just uh, southwest of Penticton, um, and this record since 2011. Next slide, please. A second well in the Twin Lakes area, similar, uh, we are currently at uh, maximum ever recorded condition and slightly above last year's trend. Next slide, please. 
So we've seen lots of uh, flooding in this southern area um, and following with that as well. We're having high water levels in the Willowbrook well. Um, you can see the water level in the aquifer is less than two meters below ground surface. Next slide, please. Tucklenewit, uh, just in the northern aspect of Oliver, we're again above uh, historically measured levels in the aquifer as well. Next slide, please. As we see also in the other well in Oliver, which is just a bit south and measuring off from the other side of the valley, we've got conditions that are higher than ever recorded. Next slide, please. And for our last well, so this is on Anarchist Mountain. It is a bedrock well, so um, a bit deep and uh, a bit higher elevation than the, some of the previous wells. Um, you can see that the water level right now, again, that medium blue color is between average and um, lowest recorded levels at this point. Next slide, please. So just in summary, um, we've got many shallow aquifers that are average to historically high. Uh, deep and high elevation aquifers are more close to what we would have as typical water levels or a bit below typical water levels. Um, and a lot of uh, water levels in the south really coincide again with what we've been seeing on the news and has been reported by the other folks. And we've got historically high levels kind of across the uh, South Okanagan area. Slide, please. Nelson, next slide, please. Thank you. So I guess just as a final note, you know, in, under typical average conditions, we've got space between those sediments to in normal water levels to be able to absorb some of the high water levels that we see in fresh shed and surface water so the water can move from surface water and uh, groundwater allows for a bit of a buffer there but as we have high water levels in many of the areas especially in the south at this point um, and lots of potential for it to expand high water levels across the, the more northern part of the Okanagan we, we lose a lot of that capacity. Um, so that's where we are right now, and there's a new groundwater level data interactive map tool. If you just um, search for that, you'll be able to find the new interface, which provides the same information we historically had. You can find some trend information on Environmental Reporting BC, and you can get some further information by contacting regional staff. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That, uh, that was a great report on on uh, groundwater conditions in the Okanagan. Um, our next speaker is Ray Crampton from Flinro RD, and uh, he'll be talking Nelson? a little bit about the flood and wildfire. Yes. Hi, Nelson. Can you hear me okay? I can. That's perfect. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me on this call and, um, and holding this webinar. I think these are extremely valuable, and uh, I think you'll see them recognized in... Uh, the topic I'm going to be talking about next, which is the BC 2017 Flood and Wildfire Review, otherwise known as the After Action Review. And um, most of us know why this was commissioned. Uh, it was one of the worst years ever that, that we've seen with respect to flood and wildfire. And we even had the trifecta of, of a drought towards the end of the summer in the Okanagan here. A uh, state of emergency lasted at least 10 weeks, uh, over 65,000 residents and business owners displaced. Flood response flood response cost estimated at over 73 million. Most of that was felt right here. And uh, the fire suppression costs were unprecedented at more than $564 million. So uh, not since the Filman report of 2004 has the government uh, commissioned an after action review like this uh, in October. Um, the BC Flood and Wildfire Review was commissioned to George Abbott and Maureen Chapman um, to examine the implementation of both provincial and local government emergency management systems and to determine how the province can improve its governance systems, statutes, regulations, policy, and leadership practices. So the review kicked off in December and is uh, wrapped up now. As a matter of fact, uh, George and Maureen are presenting preliminary findings to uh, government today and we expect that their final report uh, will be out end of April and George figures that they've got somewhere in the vicinity of um, 70 recommendations 
uh, and, and figures 60 of them will, will uh, see the light of day. Um, I have to tell you, as, as, a, uh, as a participant in the process all the way through, I'm extremely impressed uh, with the ambitious schedule that they've kept. They've, they've toured communities all through the Caribou, the, uh, the Thompson Okanagan region, and, and uh, specific to, to this area, um, spent full some time um, examining the, uh, the um, flood response from an after action review perspective. Um, and of course, the review focused on the four phases of emergency management operation. Now, George uh, would describe himself as a recovering cabinet minister. You, you all remember he was the minister of health uh, a decade ago or more. Um, and and he's, he made it quite clear that he understands that government, both big and small, are good at throwing resources and money at the clear and present da danger of response. And, and also understands that getting money for the other pillars, as they're called, the planning and preparedness, uh, the prevention and mitigation and recovery are a little tougher in, in our world, we would say, to get through Treasury Board. And uh, I think that you'll see, uh, if I'm able to crystal ball, um, what potential recommendations might be around. It would be um, about providing some funding and some resourcing to the other three pillars. Uh, through the course of the after action review, they conducted thousands of interviews. Um, they they met with, I, I would have to say, countless emergency operations centers, both set up in local communities and on band lands, um, both from the flood and the fire perspective. Um, also, uh, there was a, a, a pretty good two-day session in Vancouver about three weeks ago where it was an, a technical experts forum where a lot of the uh, local uh, flood response and fire response uh, types that we know and they're probably on this call attended. Uh, also there was an, an open house in Kelowna a few weeks ago and, and that's where we saw um, some, some pretty good interviews and conversations with some of the victims of flooding. There were folks from Mill Creek uh, vicinity, Mission Creek, of course Okanagan Lake um, and um, some of the senior uh, local government and um, I think they even, Nelson, had a, a good interview with the board as well, right? Um, so through it all, um, I, George and Maureen are, are very confident that they've got uh, a, a good set of recommendations. Um, and uh, just to give you an inkling of where I think they might be going, uh, with respect to the planning and preparedness pillars, leadership um, uh, comes to the top as, as um, an opportunity uh, for continuous improvement. And, and when I say that, it's it's the uh, it's the myriad of uh, the interconnectedness of the different response uh, groups, that being Emergency Management BC, our ministry, um, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, local government, First Nations, being as efficient as, as, as it can possibly be. And, and to that end, improving Emergency Operations Center functionality, people knowing their roles and responsibilities coming into the season. On the prevention and mitigation side of things, um, better identifying and actioning known risks and, and um, doing some mitigation of, of these risks. And if I think of some examples where work's going on right now, um, many of you may have driven past Mill Creek and seen some of the, uh, the uh, vegetation removal that's going on to, to sort of help uh, the water flow through uh, that system a little better. Dredging is a very popular uh, uh, recommendation with some folks, but that's not without uh, with it without its its issues as well. But that just a, an example. Um, another example from the forest fire prevention perspective is uh, our ministry is working with the city of Kelowna on a 4,000 hectare uh, area in the southeast slopes of Kelowna, with an eye on treating um, probably up to a thousand hectares and reducing. Uh, forest fuel, hence the threat of um, horrific wildfire like we've seen in the last decade. Uh, so same ways for uh, the community of Joe Rich, where Tolco Industries has been approved, approved for funding to do some fuel mitigation around that community. Uh, and, and when we think about response, it's, it's how can we be the most seamless and coordinated in our response, uh, people knowing their roles, um, avoiding two trucks or two helicopters showing up to the same site, or worse yet, None at all. And then communication, improving communication, um, reining in the social media side of thing and making sure that there's a central depository for communication for folks 
particularly with evacuees, to get the most current and, and uh, um, updated information. Um, recovery is a big one, and, it, and when we talk about recovery, it's not just the land base and physical infrastructure stuff. When we look at the caribou, uh, the, the need to reestablish community resilience, and that is the socioeconomic economic community resilience, uh, along with the, uh, with the land base. Over 1.2 million hectares of timber uh, gone. Uh, there's probably only the capacity and the ability to, to pick up 10 to 20 percent of that. And, uh, and then, then there's the, uh, the, the loss of jobs. There's been a big impact to the ranching community up there, as, as you can well imagine. So it's, it's working with uh, those communities to, um, on recovery. In the Okanagan, uh, property owners, you know, of the 3,000 some odd docks in the system, half of them, 1,500 were destroyed or, or badly damaged. And, um, you know, making uh making the application process and and helping increase the capacity for for pile drivers and and uh dock builders uh to do their thing in a, in a timely manner and then just the the final recommendation i'd point to on the recovery side would be providing the ways and means and taking away the bureaucratic hurdles for property owners to build back better so we can all think of what we would call the insurance barriers and and uh and i guess some of the red tape and bylaws that that prevent that very thing. Okay, so that's the after action review. Uh, look forward to the report uh, toward the end of the month. And now just a quick um, forecast, long range on, on the fire season we appear to be heading into. So you heard Dave Campbell uh, and, and you heard him say that we came into the, um, um, into, the, uh, into the season looking like we're switching from El Nino to La Nina. And, and what that means from a meteorological perspective, I'm told, is that uh, the forecast is for near or slightly warmer, drier than average conditions this spring. In other words, you know, we could be tracking towards a hot summer and, and a fairly intense fire year. Um, quite early to tell at this point, and I think in the May webinar, we might have a better handle on that. That's it for me, Nelson. Ray, thank you very much. Um, as we approach 12 o'clock and the end to this um, uh, presentation, um, I'd just like to uh, really talk a little bit about our next webinar. So we're going to have our, our second and final webinar this year on Tuesday, May 8th, and we'll have an opportunity to um, see where and, and what the water supply in the Okanagan is doing at that time, uh, as I think everybody on this call can see it's it's really all hands on deck right now from a number of different agencies uh, as uh, we anticipate the melt of um, of a, a large snowpack a larger than usual one uh, at this time I'd like to thank uh, Dave Ray Kelly Gwen Nicole and Sean uh, for their presentations and I appreciate that everybody is incredibly busy at this time of the year um, but really appreciate uh, getting this message out and communicating the current status of the water supply in the Okanagan and I hope that everybody comes and joins us uh, for Tuesday, May 8th, uh, 11 a.m. for a similar uh, updated presentation on the supply of water in the Okanagan. Uh, I hope everybody has a great day, and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean.